My name is Liv Arnesen. I'm from Norway. I'm based in the outskirts of Oslo. Um, my first and or biggest achievement was to ski solo and then support to the South Pole in uh, 1994. And since that, I teamed with an American explorer, Anne Bancroft, and we have combined adventure and education ever since. Right now, I'm since it's a pandemic, I do a coaching one-to-one and we are walking and talking. So that's what I'm doing right now. I was reading on your blog that, um, that it was your childhood dream to ski to the South Pole. And I'd love to hear more about your childhood and what that was like. You know, where did you grow up? Did you have brothers and sisters? How much did your parents influence you in in having this dream? Yeah, I grew up in the outskirts of Oslo. And um, as is very common for Norwegians, we love the outdoors. Uh, Some people are moving into Norway, immigrants, they have the impression that uh, our religion is, is Mother Nature. And I think the same was with my upbringing. So we were in normally skiing and hiking. Uh, and um, I have one brother that is two year, years uh, younger than me. And my mother, she's 91 and still fit. My father died three years ago. I'm divorced, three girls and six grandchildren. Um, but my... If, I was a very quiet, introvert child. When you were growing up, do you remember um, or were there any female role models in exploration or any female role models that you looked up to? I I got the dream of the salt pole when I was eight years old because then my father, who is a contractor, he did some maintenance work on um, Fritjof Nansen's house. Yeah, he's uh, also a polar explorer and a scientist and also a Nobel Peace Prize literate. Um, and I heard about him. And I, when we went home and I got his book, Skiing Across Greenland, and it, it was too too dif- difficult language for an eight-year-old. So I, I borrowed the book at school the day after, and that was Skiing to the Salt Pole with Roald Amundsen. And then I read, then I started because I'd loved skiing since I got my first skis when I was three years old. And then I went to school back and said, is it a, is it, is it a book about women that is, go, uh, you know, girls or women that is skiing? And the librarian uh, lent me a book. It was called Amour on Skis. Amour in, in Norwegian is, is, is a mother. So I thought the book was about a mother skiing. And as my mother was a good skier, I thought it was, well, this this would be an interesting book. But it was a silly book about, you know, girls that was just falling when some handsome guy came skiing. So that was really disappointed. And when I was about 12 years old, I went to the to Germany with my school brass band. And we were about eight girls sitting in a room exchanging dreams. And all my friends, they were dreaming about a um, handsome husband, big house, a fancy car. And I was very naive when I was 12 years old, I have to tell. And uh, when it was my turn, I said, uh, well, and I, I remember I was thinking how boring to dream about something that would come automatically to you when you grow up, I was thinking. But uh, and when it was my turn to tell my dream, I said, my dream is to ski to the South Pole. And to this day, I remember their reaction. The laughter is impossible. That's a boy's dream. So that's when I really first th- realized that was no women had done that before. And I think it, it was and, you know, I, I just thought it was something wrong with me but in the, and on the other hand I love skiing and I just kept that dream still kept that dream and when I came across a book about uh, Madame Curie and um, uh, the scientist she was I really love that book and her stories because she was the first woman that uh, was allowed to enter the Sor- University of Sorbonne in Paris and I was thinking hmm Marie, uh, Marie 
to, she can attend the the the, the university as the first woman. Woman, maybe I can ski to the South Pole. So I think that was so. There was not an adventure, but it was more a scientist that really was inspiring for me when I was a kid. It's almost heartbreaking hearing those words. That's a boy's dream. It like yeah. oh. God, it's like crushing to the soul. And I just I just hope little girls growing up now know that it's not about boys' dreams and girls' dreams. It's like just about having these these dreams. And and your dream was to go and ski to the South Pole. And you were part of the first all women team to make the unsupported um oh sorry, you did Greenland first, didn't you? Yeah, I did uh, Greenland with a friend. Uh, the, that was the first and supported uh, uh, crossing of women. And um, and I actually asked Julia, she, uh, we were guiding together on Spitsbergen, if she wanted to join me on on, uh, on on the South Pole expedition. But she was more a climber, so she was too tired of the wide open spaces. So And I'd also been on an expedition on Greenland the year before, then one of the members totally mentally collapsed. So I was figuring out I I I I don't know anybody that really wants so much to ski to the South Pole as myself. And it's really tiresome to have, you know, a team member that hates to be where you love to be. So that's why I decided to go solo. Yeah. I'd love for you to share more about that because you skied 745 miles to reach the South Pole, which you did in 50 days. You did it solo. How did you even get to that point? And, you know, going back to 1994 now when you did it, um, which is just amazing. Was it easy for you to get the funding and sponsorship? Was it something that you paid for yourself? Yeah, How did it all sort of come about? From the very beginning, it's the, that's the hardest part to get the funding. And I think it's partly because I felt I was moving into the men's last arena in Norway. The you know, was, That was a, such an area I shouldn't go into. And, and also, secondly, because men have some more a network, so they have friends. And, um, and I remember I was in so many uh, possible, uh, meetings with potential sponsors, and they asked, have, have you ever hold a sled, my dear? And uh, I got so many stories from them, from the winter service in the military, you know. So that's, it's so many Norwegians still we, we low, low in, we are used to the winter that not necessarily are that experienced camping in, in, in the winter time. So um, I didn't get any Norwegian sponsors. Uh, it was an, another Norwegian uh, explorer, Berge Auslan. He has a sponsor, Italian sponsor. And when they heard that I didn't have any sponsors, they said, "Well, if you make it, we'll pay it." But you can. <laughs> but I had to take up a personal loan, and they paid me when I when I came back home. Of course, I got Norwegian skis and equipment, but not you know not insurance and travel and everything. So. Um, so I put a, uh, took up a personal loan, but it was also the year before I skied solo. There was a Norwegian guy that uh, was the first to ski solo and send supported, Alin Kage, and I knew him. And I, I because I've been guiding so many years on Spitsbergen on the glaciers, I knew that I was uh, experienced on glaciers, and I knew that I was a pretty good uh, skier. So I figure out and I said to my the next uh, husband that I wonder if I just should fulfill my dream and skip to the South Pole. And he said right away, I'm so sure you can make it. So I get support from home and friends. And so that's how the funding was. I had to put up a loan and then they paid me back. Yeah. Did you enjoy it when you were out there, you know, being alone, being in the cold, being in that, you know, that white desert was, you know, when your dream actually became a reality, was it what you were expecting? Yeah, it was, you know, it's, um, it takes some, uh, a couple of days, you know, to get into the rhythm. And I, I don't remember, I wrote something in my uh, log that, you know, it's, you know, this is fantastic. This is really true. And uh, as an introvert, you know, I, I love being alone. I brought poetry and, you know, my mind went all over. So, and the days went pretty fast, actually. So I really enjoyed the, I enjoyed the trip. What was the biggest challenge for you when you were out there? 
Huh. You know, it's, I felt like that, like I really was on a holiday because <laughs> I've been working so hard getting the funding and getting everything, you know, dealed with, you know, contracts and stuff. So, so, and I had been skiing on the uh, crossing Greenland two years earlier. It's, it's the same thing, really. Uh, we've used 23 days on Greenland. This is a double. And um, I was especially when I was, you know, it's the crevasses. It's the, sort of the scary thing when you are on your own. So I was really, really careful. And I, when I started, I knew I could make it because you, you don't, when you start on an expedition like that, you don't think maybe I can do it. You just, this is going to be, this is going to be a success and you have to be careful. So I was really careful and I didn't ski very fast, you know, not to get to, uh, tired. So I skied, plugging along 10 hours a day and covered about 25 kilometers. I could, of course, it went faster, but, you know, I was just thinking, you know, taking care of it's cold and don't get too exhausted and so like that. So I, I really enjoyed myself. I love that. Sometimes it's not suffering I think is um it's almost I think sometimes especially maybe in the adventure world there's there's been a time where it's almost like people have got to suffer in order to to achieve and so it's really nice to hear when somebody just really enjoys and it and it's their passion after reaching the south pole and achieving your dream when you came back and you and you'd accomplished it did you suffer from adventure blues did you struggle to know what you wanted to do next or did you have a clear plan and vision about the next steps that you wanted to take when i stayed uh, 10 days at the south pole walking working as a dishwasher at the base so i, I you know then you had just very fast to normal life again and at that time before i started i was a high school teacher so I've, I planned to go back teaching, but when I, um, and then I came back home and, and met my former students and they were sort of, wow, you know, dream. And, you know, we just started to talk about dreams and they were talking, writing about that themselves. So then I was thinking I should do something more, I, I should do something more about adventure and education. And then I was also invited the world around to lecture, uh, Australia. And when I come back to Oslo, the Norwegian Business School asked me to have um, some series of lecture of risk management. So I was thinking, oh, risk management. And then I saw their program in uh, uh, Master of Management. So I took a degree in Master in Management at the Business School because I realized that everything that happened in an expedition happens in all organizations in a tiny family or a big corporate you know what's what's which, which direction do you want to go uh, how to do it who to pick the best team uh, risk management um, and so on so on so so that's has been my work since since that day and later when i teamed up with the american woman and bancroft we crossed the, the she, uh, she, uh, she wrote me a letter <laughs> and asked if I wanted to join her crossing the uh, Antarctic continent and kind of use that expedition to, to promote knowledge about how to, we created a curriculum called um, Dare to Dream and a multi-subject about Antarctica. And that was in the beginning of internet, it was 2000, 2001. And we had, um, I think, 6 million followers in 116 countries. And we called CNN twice a week, so it sort of exploded. So after that, we basically have continued to do different adventures, combining uh, education and adventure. So, that, so that's sort of, uh, that's what I do at now and then. And then I have my sort of normal work with corporate and other organizations. So the Sopol expedition actually changed changed my career a bit absolutely and six million followers back in 2000 2001 is a is a huge number of people tell me more about Anne and tell me more about the planning and the preparation for the sailing and, and skiing across Antarctica's landmass how did you um yeah so she you know wrote a letter to connect with you initially did you manage to meet up before you before the expedition? Did you do any practice runs? You know, how did you know that you'd be compatible as a team? 
Yeah, she wrote me a letter, and uh, and I'm really intrigued by the the plan combining education and adventure. Because after the reaction my students in high school got, you know that, you know why did why and how and so the, we started to they I made them start to make their own plans, find their own dreams, and they f- found that fantastic, uh, interesting and fun. So th- when I got the letter from Anne, I was into the same sort of thinking, and she had uh, skied to the to the South Pole with an American team. In 1993, the plan was to cross, but some, you know, because of funding, uh, some injuries, I think they they stopped at the South Pole. At that time, she had debt because she had a loan, as I had, and uh, it took some years. And in 1998, I got the letter, and then she had got a team together that would help with make, uh, creating sponsors and helping with to promote the educational. Uh, program and so there's five people working full time with the expedition when I came over to Minnesota and visit Anne. So that was uh that was you know something very new for me <laughs> and for I guess most explorers that's that's coming that's you actually have an organization behind you. And I didn't know her and we just um, she's also an uh, introvert so we just walked and talked the first days and we didn't talk about the expedition really we just talked about our life and our dreams and our family and, and then I realized that her uh, parents had the same expedition books as my parents in their bookshelves so there were so many similarities and uh, also she's also a former teacher so, um, so we team. They just decided to team up, and um, we are. Um, I call Anne my sister, so, and I think she is doing the same. So that was fantastic to find, you know, uh, such a sister soul on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean. Was there ever any conflict or any issues between the two of you while you were out on your expedition? No, uh, it's um, I wouldn't call Anna procrastinator, but it sometimes it takes too long time to because I'm very impatient and she's not, you know that's this thing when we did, was discussing things and never come to a conclusion. So I think we we still are doing the same. I say I just said, could you you know gas put on the, to keep foot on the gas and then she's saying to me can you just slow down so i think that's but i think that's the two different personalities is really good when you have a big project i can wait a week or some days and she can just put up some speed sometimes so i think that's the that's a difference in a difference in our personalities I mean, one of the things that you talked about as well is around risk management and you know, managing risk and and I think it can almost be almost overlooked nowadays because you hear so many people going off to climb the highest mountains in the world, to ski the South Pole, you know, sailing around the world, doing Mm. these incredible challenges. The risk is has almost been reduced due to due to technology and GPS and you know being able to be in constant contact with people all the times and you know the development of new products and new gear. How do you manage risk is there stuff that you're doing beforehand to to manage risk you know what what do you do to keep yourself safe in these extreme situations i go through all the possible risk that i can take you know to turn on all prob turn out all problems and um, how to solve them for instance if i what if i fell into a crevasse when i was on my own Okay, I had a tiny rucksack so that I could put on the emergency beacon. I can just put it, you know, it was behind my neck. I had two ice screws with rope in my pockets. It's, you know, it's theory, but I had done everything that I could possibly do in, in addition to be very careful. And... Um, Many people know they just they have never been skiing before. They have never been camping outdoors, and they go on a group skiing to the the last degree to the South Pole. They suffer because they haven't experienced. So I, you know, starting to ski when I was three years old, and slowly, low, you know, by doing mistakes and knowing how to behave in bad weather, in winter, in storm. We had a cabin. 
I, I have it now in a cabin in the um, in the mountains of uh, Norway, where it's a very windy, very often blizzards. So I learned to cope with that, you know, step by step. So I was lucky, but we do have the same sort of, I could say, problem because we have so many more rescue operations also in Norway now because people haven't taken, you know, making their own experiences. They just jump and do the most extreme thing because they have the money to buy a, a guide or buy a trip. My generation, you know, took step by step. And that was, of course, uh, a big advantage for me. In terms of adventure, you know, you've, you've been involved in the world of adventure for 30, yeah, 30 odd years now from Greenland in 1992 and um, you know, South Pole and Antarctica and the Arctic Ocean. How has the adventure world changed in your perspective from when you started to where it is now? We were really privileged in the old days. We don't have to go the fastest or the most extreme routes. And so I feel very privileged that I, I lived in that time. And no, you have, and I guess it's also getting harder to get sponsors. To be honest, I don't really follow all these extreme expeditions anymore. So I just, you know, help people, you know, if they ask me to help, you know, for a, for a polar expedition or something. But it's so many, you know, that's, uh, so it's hard to follow, I think. Yeah. What does adventure mean to you? Adventure means that you have to uh, get out of your um, comfort zone and learn something new go on a different area like i think my most my hardest expedition what i feel just mentally and physically was uh, doing the ganges from source to sea in i think it was 12 or something 2012 and um, we were doing the expedition during the valley the uh, celebrating the light and we were camping by the shores of uh, ganges and uh, there were so many parties and music and firework. It was so much noise. It was so much smell. It is, and you know, when you're used to ski in this serene, wide open or being, you know, more in nature, being surrounded by so many people and so much noise and so much dirt. <laughs> so I think that was the hardest part for me. Uh, or the hardest expeditions uh, expedition. But then we had um, uh, Anne and I created a project called Access Water, and we make uh, we had made a curriculum called uh, together with the United Nations and the uh, international scouts organizations. And um, so, so and we invited a woman from each continent in the different age, different background, different experience, different religion. So we, um, we 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 as a team had to work together, as the rest of the world had to work together to solve the freshwater challenge. So that was the first expedition with this team, and some of them were used to so much people, and um, so that was a very interesting uh, expedition for me, and for Anna too. You know, being in loving these outdoors in the in the white open. Planes. Oh my god! Absolutely. I mean, one of the things that gets talked about on on expeditions and challenges is that you do go through these tough and challenging situations, and and a lot of it is to do with your mental resilience, your mental grit, your mental determination. I'd love for you to share a little bit more around your mindset and how you approach challenging situations and how you overcome them. I've been competing in orienteering and cross country skiing when I was younger. So I learned uh, and I had, and I injured my back uh, when I was 15 years old and was also taken by avalanche when I was in my early 20s. So I had had a lot of back pain. And uh, through sport I lo- lo- learned, you know, how to handle uh, my mental, you know, not to focus on what was good. But also uh, focus on you know what uh, what to expect from a race or a competition, and um, you know it's 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 like this a risk management again. You think about what is going to happen. How can I do the be best possibly prepared? 
and also I grew up with um with a father that says because I was very impatient and he said well you can do what you you you, you can do what you want but you know you have to practice your patience so I think that's you know that was also good when you grow up with uh, get that message from your parent you can do what you want or wish but you know just take your time you have to be prepared you can't get it right away so i think that was a good thing to grow up with and um now also i have been interested in psychology to know you know after i started coaching and so on so but i think the the first what i learned from my coaches when i was about 14 15 years old is is really was really helpful i think i'm from childhood is just born mentally strong. I think that's, I think I, if things goes bad, you know, I don't get depressed or just thinking, hmm, how can I do it better next time? I think I grew up that with that very early. So I think I just have to thank my parents. <laughs> have you mastered patience? Have you figured that out? Are you a more patient person now? It depends on uh, <laughs> it depends on what I'm I'm planning or doing, but uh, I think uh, I hope I get wiser and wiser for every you know every tenth year <laughs> tenth year. So yeah, I'm I can be impatient with uh, people that is sort of um, just messing things up for others, not on not for me, but you know you just pull yourself together or I can just say that you know this uh, so no I, I think I still have a little impatience in me but I'm not as I was as like I was 10 years old <laughs> are you and Anne working on any new projects or expeditions together yeah if the pandemic well, if COVID-19 hasn't come visiting we had been would be uh, canoeing or uh, kayaking the uh, river in New Zealand some of the team in January this in 21 so we have put that on hold because we, we have a Maori uh, woman from New Zealand on our team and uh, that is a river that got uh, human rights it's in the sort of the Maori uh, country so that was the plan to just follow uh, because our plan is to a paddle or go be on one river on each continent with this international team and promote the curriculum we have made. Oh, fantastic. So it was started with, uh, so the first one was, was the Ganges. And yeah. is, the, is the New Zealand River the second one or is uh, how many other rivers have you done? We also did part of the Yangtze River in China because we have actually two members from Asia, uh, one Indian woman the first youngest that climbed uh, Mount Everest. And uh, we also have a Chinese woman. So they, she said, well, we have to do something in China to get the Chinese kids involved. So that's why we didn't took the whole Yangtze River because that was too rough <laughs> for for a big team. And we also, uh, the plan was to uh, do the Mississippi uh, two years ago, but we lost our sponsors. So that's that's still a struggle to get the funding lost for any particular reason or just just because i think just because yeah you said uh, the river got its human rights that sounds amazing yeah yeah so that's you know that's that's a neat way you know to tell and how important mother nature is so we figured out that was would be a good story to let the world know about that Oh, and you're doing this with um, Wings, is that right? Are you a Wings fellow? Yeah. Would you like to share a little bit more about what Wings is and what being a Wings fellow invo- is, it, yeah, is involved with being a Wings fellow? Uh, actually, you should ask Anne about that because she's in the board. But uh, they are um, supporting, uh, especially women that are scientists or adventurers and uh, helping them getting, you know, having the network and help do what I can to help them and give them awards if they've done something that is worth a, a, an award. So, um, so they're, they're, they are very supportive to women uh, scientists and adventurers. 
Oh, fantastic. So, Liv, I want to mix things up a little bit now. I want to ask you some quick fire questions. So, my questions may be quick, but your answers don't have to be. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. Are you a morning or evening type of person? I'm a morning type. Do you have an alarm or what time do you wake up in the morning? No, I usually get up uh, at six. I wake up at six, listen to the news and get up, have a coffee latte. And then my dog is ready for a hike, just a short hike. And then I start to read or write. Um, um, right now I'm... I'm re, re, rewriting a management book I wrote with um, UM, uh, a colleague that I uh, was on the team on Everest in 1996. So we are redoing that management book right now. And what time do you go to bed? It depends because if I'm talking to US, it can be, <laughs> it can be late, but usually around 11. Do you have a favorite movie? Um, well, I don't know. I don't think so. Of course, I um, I love um, oh, uh, what is it called again? Into no, into Africa with, with um, oh, I don't remember the name of that uh, movie. It's a very old movie. Do you have Netflix? About Karen, about Karen Blixen. Oh, I don't know that one. <laughs> no. Would you ever binge like Netflix or Amazon Prime? Is that something that you do? I don't have television. No television. Okay, wow. No. <laughs> I'm impressed. All right. <laughs> what but about? I, I, of course, I can see some news and some documentaries on my Mac, but uh, I don't have a television. Actually, I, I stopped watch television when I st- started to plan the expedition in 1994. So when, you know, people are looking at series and everything at Netflix and whatever, I'm certainly very, (laughs) I have nothing to say and comment. What about books? Is there a particular book which has really resonated with you, which is a book that you would read over and over again? Or what's the current book that you're reading at the moment? Uh, The book right now is about a poetry book that uh, I have a friend that just published it. Um, and what is Elsa reading about? It's it's about the new about uh, the world history how the water is important uh, to create new you know empires and the, going. It's a sort of the history of water related to the world history. Tell me about music. Do you listen to music? Do you have a favorite song? A favorite genre? Oh, I love Bob Dylan and Bruce Springsteen and some, of course, some Norwegian uh, musicians. Do you have a favorite piece of adventure gear or piece of kit that you're particularly fond of? No, but, um, you know, my toothpaste is really important. <laughs> <laughs> is it I mean, a t- no, not the toothpaste, but the, my toothbrush, I mean. Your toothbrush, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Now, are you more of a beach person or a mountain person? Mountain person. Mountain person. Could you uh, could you go on a beach holiday and like lie on the beach for like you know like a couple uh, like a couple of days just sunbathing? Is that something you'd ever do? No. Uh, well, uh, we did when the girls was younger. We did do to go to Mallorca, but I I was sitting in the shadow reading. That's that. I still remember that. <laughs> Tell me about food. What type? What's your favorite type of food to eat at home? And then, what's your favorite type of food to eat while you're away on expedition? Uh, my favorite food is um, trout and uh, and salmon. Uh, I, I I put it to make a wok of uh, those uh, fish woks. So I usually eat uh, eat fish when I cook on my own, and or else I just eat what I get. But at home, I uh, usually it's, it's wax uh, that I make. And then, what about expedition? Well, then it's uh, this dried food, uh, expedition food. It can be different pasta, fish, meat. Actually, the expedition food is pretty good now compared to in 1994 when I've had the feeling that I was just eating. Uh, uh, silly loose, or what you call it, uh, you know, paper, smashed paper or something. It was terrible. Uh, but today it's really good. Different dishes. 
Yeah. What do you do for rest and relaxation? Well, I read, but I, you know, I love hiking and skiing, cross country skiing. I have a cabin in the in the mountains. Then I go with my family and just play with the kids. And uh, yeah, it's you know, I don't these days. You know, it, it's the time is not very stressful, so it's you don't have the feeling that you need to rest. <laughs> you yeah, read and walk, and you know, it's I, 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 these days are really good. Slow. Do you have particular words that you sort of live your life by, whether that's like a quote or a mantra? Yeah, I, I love, uh, I just copied from Norman Warren. I met him on Greenland when I, uh, Julia, and I, Julia and I was crossing him. He said, real dreams never die. Oh, I love that. I love that. Liv, are you on social media? Where can people follow along with your adventures and challenges? Yeah, I have a uh, own website livearnesson.com uh, with Anne I have bancroftarnesson.echo I'm on Instagram livearnesson that's it awesome and leave I'd love for you to leave our listeners with final words of advice to motivate and encourage other people to step outside their comfort zones and to have big dreams and to you know, take action to achieve it, what would you say to our listeners? I would say that if you feel that your blood is uh, running a little bit faster or your heart beats a little bit faster, then you are approaching something or reading about something that is important for you. So follow that track. Absolutely. Lee, thank you so much for coming on Tough Girl Podcast to share more about your life and adventures. It's been absolutely inspiring. Thank you, Sarah. My name is Sarah Williams and I'm the host of the Tough Girl podcast and the founder of Tough Girl Challenges, which is all about motivating and inspiring you. Everything that we have talked about today will be available in the show notes at toughgirlchallenges.com. So please do go and check it out. We have spoken to a number of polar explorers before, so there are lots of episodes for you to listen to. I'm just going to highlight a few of those names so that you can go and listen to those episodes. So you can take a listen to Anne Daniels, who's the first woman in history to ski to the North and South Poles as part of all women teams. So she sled hauled over 4,000 miles, completed over 10 polar expeditions and has survived more than 400 days on the ice. Now, this is a particularly interesting podcast because Anne talks about how she took her first steps to becoming a polar explorer. At 30 years old, she'd never done anything like this before. She was actually going through a tough divorce and wait for it. She had just given birth to triplets but Anne decided she needed to follow her dreams and she wasn't going to let anything or anyone stop her so that's well worth listening to and we spoke with Anne Daniels in on August 25th 2015 so Anne was one of our pretty much first episodes that I did because the Tough Girl podcast was started in 2015. We've also spoken with Wendy Searle twice so Wendy is an adventurer she's a mother of four and she became the seventh woman to ski solo and unsupported from Hercules Inlet so what's interesting about these two episodes is is obviously when we first spoke with Wendy, Wendy shares more about the planning, the preparation, figuring out work, balancing children, the training, the mental side of preparation, everything else that goes along with it. And then in the second episode, which is the Tough Girl podcast extra, we catch up with Wendy after the expedition, what it was like to complete the challenge in 42 days, 16 hours with no rest days, no showers and skiing 720 miles. You know, she shares more about the brutal conditions, which were hard with temperatures dropping to minus 35. This was also a journey which was five years in the making and shows what hard work, commitment and focus can achieve. So those episodes are well worth listening to. All this information is available at toughgirlchallenges.com with new episodes coming out on a Tuesday and Thursday at 7am at UK time. Now, one of the things that was discussed during this episode was Wings. And I just want to share a little bit more about Wings World Quest. So Wing supports extraordinary women making important discoveries in science and exploration. Wings was formed in 2003 to identify and support the discoveries and accomplishments of women explorers and scientists and to inspire the next generation of problem solvers. To date, Wings has granted more than $700,000 to 136 women across 70 countries doing meaningful work on land, in the sea and in the air. So Wings supports women in science and exploration with a three-pronged approach. 
approach. One, advance women explorers in the field. Two, connect women explorers worldwide. And three, inspire the next generation. So if you'd like to find out more about Wings, then please do go and visit wingsworldquest.org. And there is more information about its mission, its history, its leadership, the partnerships. um, And there's more information about fellows and flag carriers. And you'll look through some of the fellows and you'll be like, oh, I recognize that name because they will have shared their story on the Tough Girl podcast. So we've spoken with, for example, Felicity Aston, who was the first woman to ski alone across Antarctica. Felicity won the 2014 Courage Award. We've also spoken with Arita Bajans, who shared more about Shambhala and some of her work that she's done in the desert and with camels. And actually, Arita's been on the Tough Girl podcast twice. So, you know, absolutely incredible women, really, really fascinating. And I love the work that Wings is doing so please do go and check that out wingsworldquest.org they are also on social media as well so please do go and find them on instagram twitter facebook like engage to be kept up to date with the work that they are doing thank you again for all of your incredible support the tough girl podcast is sponsorship and ad free and that's thanks to you the patrons if you'd like to support the tough girl podcast and the work that i'm doing to increase the amount of female role models in the media then please do go and visit patreon p-a-t-r-e-o-n.com forward slash tough girl podcast